able let's stand and hear our call to worship we read this in genesis 1 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of god was hovering over the face of the waters and god said let there be light and there was light and god saw that the light was good and god separated the light from the darkness the spirit of god has been around forever even in the beginning, hovering over the earth as God gloriously created the light and sky, oceans, clouds, stars, and planets. He lovingly and creatively made the animals, and then he did something very special. He made people in his image. So let's sing and rejoice in our God.
perfect world that God created didn't stay perfect for too long. Adam and Eve turned from trusting God to other things. Brokenness, pain, and suffering entered the world. Even now we see the effects of the fall in our lives. I see it in my own life as we try to gain comfort and intimacy in other places than God. Let's read from Ephesians 2 together. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Let's pray this morning, telling God, our brokenness and confessing specific ways we look other places for belonging and comfort and intimacy. Let's pray together. Father, we know the world is not like it should be. You created this world beautiful and good, but we have messed up that picture. We think we'll be satisfied with relationships and we forget that our ultimate satisfaction and comfort comes from you. Please, Holy Spirit, help us to repent. Forgive us, Lord, and help us turn to you.
When we were far from God, he came to us at a great, great cost. Jesus became human and put himself through the same kinds of temptations that we have. But he lived 33 years on this earth without looking other places for satisfaction and for belonging. Jesus looked to God for his hope. And then he took the punishment that we deserve as he died on the cross. Finally, he rose from the dead. Now let's celebrate as we read about this good news. Let's read together the underlined portion. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. From deep within my spirit sings Holy, holy In the splendor of your majesty From deep within my spirit sings Holy, holy In the splendor of your majesty From deep within my spirit sings
Let's pray. Jesus, you have been so gracious to us at the cross. Help us to see you as glorious so that we will look only to you for comfort in the hard things of life. Help us to see that the other places that we look will never completely deliver what they promise. You are the only one who really promises life and who can fully deliver. Amen. And as we move into our greeting time, let's lovingly welcome one another as Christ has lovingly welcomed us into his family. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, you guys. Good morning, everybody. Hey, before we uh, get to announcements and everything else, I wanted to... Um, introduce some of you. Some of you know this family, some don't, um, but this is Jacinia and Larry Purvis, and uh, one of two girls, um, and uh, Larry's first day on staff with New City is today. He is joining us. He's joining us as our community and connections pastor, um, so that means he is uh, over overseeing our missional communities, our greeters, and hospitality, and Sunday morning stuff. So um, they have been at New City Eastside for the last two years and were, I don't know, five years or more with us here before they went to help with the replanting of New City Eastside. So it's a welcome back for them, uh, but two years is a long time to be away, so there are a lot of faces that they won't know this morning, uh, and some of you, it will be a first time meeting them. If you haven't already met them, introduce yourselves today, uh, meet them, and welcome them to New City. Glad to have you guys on board. Welcome. And welcome to you guys, especially those of you who might be visiting with us this morning. Welcome to New City. If you are visiting and you haven't already stopped by the Connect Bar, we would love to have you stop by and meet one of our Connect team members. Uh, they can answer questions about New City. They have information uh, about the church there. But we also have a gift for you, just a small way of saying thank you for being with us. Uh, and we would love to send you home with that. So um, if you, even if you're not going to come back, if you're just passing through, uh, we would still love to send you home with a gift. Uh, it has the new city logo on it, and uh, that way when you see it, you can remember us and pray for us. And because you stopped by our Connect Bar and shared a little bit of information with us, um, we will be praying for you as well. I promise we won't harass you and follow up. Uh, we'll send you an email this week just saying that we were glad uh, that you were uh, here with us, and uh, if there's anything that we can do to help you, we would love to do that. Um, this past week, uh, with Larry coming on, Larry will be the one who uh, responds to those emails. For the past couple of Sundays, I have been the one to respond to those emails, and some of you have terrible handwriting. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you got my email or not. Um, I'm joking, I really am, uh, but uh, on the email address, just as I was thinking about sending emails, that came to mind. Um, we would love to send you an email, so help us, help us by making it really clear what that is. 
unless you don't want an email from us, then just make it sloppy. Um, hopefully you got one of these when you came in. There are some announcements on it, a couple that I want to remind you of. One, if you haven't checked out our resource shelves out there, great resources uh, available. Those are gospel-centered resources. We want to help you grow in your walk with Jesus, and that's what they, they are there for. Um, you will generally find them cheaper here than you can buy online. Um, because we want to resource you with good materials. We have a parent-child dedication that is coming up really soon. Uh, and if you uh, are interested in participating in that, send Amanda an email or talk with her today and let her know um, so that we can add you to our list and get you all the information that you need. Okay, um, welcome again. Uh, this week we are wrapping up our sermon series on the Holy Spirit um, and I have really enjoyed um, going through this uh, with you guys. Um, I want to run through sort of just what we've talked about for those who are visiting to give some context to what we are going to talk about today. But just in this series, we have um, talked about a number of things. We started in week one with who the Holy Spirit is, right? Like not what the Holy Spirit is. Um, Holy Spirit is a person, the third person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, the Holy Spirit is not a, a mystical power. Um, the Holy Spirit is someone that we can relate to. We looked at um, how God remained in the Old Testament, even after Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden because of sin. God was not um, pleased to be separated from humanity, and so it was the Holy Spirit who was God with his people, leading, guiding, helping, teaching them throughout the Old Testament. We saw as we came to the New Testament how Jesus interacted with the Holy Spirit and how dependent that Jesus was on the Holy Spirit uh, in his ministry, in his life, and certainly in the miracles that, uh, um, that, that we see in Jesus. We looked at John 14, 15, and 16 and the promises that Jesus made to his disciples and to us um, of who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit would do. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit was coming and he would indwell um, every believer, everyone who loves and follows Jesus. Jesus said the Holy Spirit would make his home with us and would abide with us until the day of our redemption. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will be our helper. This is incredible. God with us. God has come to help us, his people, leading us, teaching us, um, bringing us conviction um, through us, bringing others to the place of conviction, reminding us, the Holy Spirit reminding us of all that Jesus has taught, reminding us of the things that we read in the word of God. We saw that he manifests himself in the lives of believers, those who love and follow Jesus. He manifests himself in us and through us, through what we call the spiritual gifts. And we talked about those spiritual gifts. These, these beautiful gifts are God's way of continuing to provide for us, his people, through the Holy Spirit. Last week, we talked about um, life in the Spirit, what it, what it means to walk in the Spirit. Um, we, we, we talked about what it looks like for us as we walk by the Spirit and, and how we walk by the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit through faith, truly believing who the Spirit is and what the Spirit does, truly believing all of those promises that Jesus made to us about the Spirit, right? Not just knowing the promises about the Holy Spirit, but believing and trusting that those promises are true, that God is faithful and the word of Jesus is faithful and all of those promises are real and true for each one of us. And when we do that, when we, when we live with that faith, we walk by faith, trusting in the Holy Spirit with confidence, then what we saw is the fruit of the Spirit will bear itself in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. This morning I want to I want to close out by thinking about what all of this means for for us corporately, New City Church. And the question that we'll ask through this morning is what would it look like for us to be a church walking with the spirit? Or if we were a church that was genuinely walking with the spirit, what are things that we would see um, in and of New City Church? So Let's pray together this morning. Um, pray with me, if you would. Um, 
pray, don't just listen. Uh, pray that God would be good to us this morning to teach us, that the Holy Spirit um, would be good to bring conviction in our lives where that is needed and encouragement where that's needed as well. Um, that the Holy Spirit would be good more and more today using the Word of God to shape us into the image of Jesus. Would you pray those things with me? Good. Let's pray together. Father, we do come together and what a, a privilege that is, not just to pray, but that we can each pray and, and you, our good and gracious Father, you hear our prayers and already this morning you've been at work to answer those prayers. We, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be, would be good to teach us. We thank you, Father, for um, just the gift of worship that we've already had this morning, that, that, that your Spirit is here as we sing and praise your name. Um, we pray that your spirit would be great as we, as we turn to your word, Father. That you would teach us and, and, and that the Holy Spirit would, as Jesus has promised, bring conviction to us, conviction of sin and conviction of what is good and righteous, um, conviction even of, of judgment. Uh, we pray, Father, that your spirit would be good to, to encourage us this morning. Some of the things that we're going to talk about we, we should be encouraged in as they are a part of life at New City Church. We love you. Shape us into the image of Jesus for the good of your people and for your great glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want us to go back to Galatians this morning. That's where we were last week. And um, um, Galatians 5, we'll look primarily at Galatians 5 and Galatians 3. If you have your Bible and want to go there, do. Um, we should have everything on the screen as well. Um, as we get ready to look at these verses, one thing I wanted to talk about, it, it is our natural inclination, especially in our Western culture, um, really to make everything about us. Uh, and I mean that like in an individual sense. When, when we come to the Word of God and we read the Word of God, we immediately apply it directly to ourselves as individuals. And this isn't necessarily bad. For example, last week we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, and each one of us in our lives should bear the fruit of the Spirit as we are walking with the Spirit. So there is that, that individual application of the Word of God in that, in that sense, but, but there's more. Uh, the Word of God also applies um, most often to not just me as an individual, but to me as something bigger than just me. Um, it, it applies to me as a, as, as a part of something much greater, and what I'm talking about is us, the church. The Word of God is not always just meant individually for me as a person or you as a person. It's meant for us corporately. So when we ask the question, what would it look like for us to be a church that's walking with the Spirit? Here's where we start. We are walking by the Spirit together. We are walking by the Spirit together. Not just a bunch of individuals walking by the Spirit, but we together are walking by the Spirit. Let's go back. Look at Galatians chapter 5 with me, um, beginning in verse 16. Paul writes this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. We talked about these last week. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step or walk with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. But I say, Paul writes, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the flesh. So normally when we read that, we make that personal application immediately. We make this a singular you like it is about me. But the word that Paul uses here is, of course, plural. 
So in the, in the South, in our context, we would translate that as y'all. Y'all. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and y'all will not gratify the flesh. We didn't read this in, in chapter 6 last week, um, but look at chapter 6, verse 1 with me. Paul writes, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. And what I want to point out in that, um, in this, is, is that, that Paul is going from, from this plural of, of y'all, right? The church walking in the spirit and not in the flesh, to now the church helping one another to, to live in that way, right? So, so Paul has said, if y'all, plural, if y'all would, would not walk in the flesh, um, you won't be doing these things. If you all will walk in the Spirit, then it will be this way. And now, now Paul is shifting gears and, and he's talking about bearing one another's burdens. He, he, is, he is saying that we should be working together for the good of one another. When Paul says, um, you who are more spiritual should restore a brother in sin... Um, what he means by more spiritual in this context is um, it, it, those of you who are walking with the Spirit and, and you see a brother or a sister who, who is walking in the flesh and their life is bearing the fruit of someone who is walking in the flesh, Paul is saying, you guys who are walking in the Spirit, you need to help your brothers and your sisters out, help them to walk in the Spirit as well. And if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we started our message that morning on the spiritual gifts with understanding that God created each of us with a lack. We all lack every one of us. Adam was incomplete, and that's why um, God made Eve. Eve was incomplete without Adam. They complemented one another. They were not meant, they were not created to live in isolation and alone. And the same is true for us in the body of Christ. We are not okay alone. Let me say that again. We are not okay when we are living our lives alone. God did not create us for that. We are not created to live alone. We need each other. Now, I am not talking about, I'm not talking about introverts who need a few minutes alone so that they can recharge. That is me. I need that as well. I'm going to go home this afternoon and crash. That's going to be my recharge. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that God did not create us to live in isolation. And when we find ourselves withdrawing from community altogether and the family that God created us for, when we find ourselves doing that, something is wrong. I can tell you we are not walking by the Spirit. Because walking by the Spirit means that we understand that God has, has placed us in a family. We need one another. God created us that way. God created me to have a need that only you guys can meet. God created each of you to have a need that only the other people here can meet as well. We, we need each other. We, we, we need each other in, in not just day-to-day -day life and in those areas of lack, but what Paul is saying here is that we need one another in our spiritual walk with the Spirit. If, if we are walking by the Spirit, we need one another to help one another in our walk with the Spirit. We need to be reminded, for example, that, that we have this relationship with the Spirit. We need to be pressed by our brothers and sisters to believe the promises that Jesus made to us concerning what the Spirit would do and who the Spirit is. We need to be asked sometimes when we have um, made a decision or we are seeking to make a decision in our life, is this something that the Spirit is leading you in? Do you sense that the Spirit goes before you? Is the Spirit with you in the decision that you are making? We need one another to press one another in this walk with the Spirit. And Paul says, when someone in our family, he uses the words, is caught in transgression. 
when we see someone in our family and, and the, the, the fruit that they are bearing in their life is not the fruit of the Spirit, but the fruit of the flesh. Paul says when we see someone caught in transgression, then we need to gently point those people back to the gospel and, and, and to their walk with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. We need each other, and we need to be able to call a brother or sister out and, and tell them to turn gently again, to turn from the sin that they are pursuing and, and help them walk again with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that's, that's a difficult thing. Like, this is probably not if you've been in church very long, first time you've ever heard somebody say something like that, and yet we don't do it. So I, I recognize that it's difficult. It's difficult to point out sin in someone else's life. It makes us vulnerable, right? Because we are putting ourselves at risk that we'll be rejected and, and, and unloved because we've told a friend, a brother, or a sister what's happened. I, I know it's hard on our end. It's also hard to be the person who is being told, hey, th this isn't good. The fruit that you're bearing in your life isn't the fruit of the Spirit. This is the fruit of the flesh, and, and, and what the Lord calls us to do is repent and to turn. I, I know that is difficult. And yet the truth is, it is a grace from God. God has given us one another to do this very thing with one another, to help one another in the spiritual journey that we're on, to help one another in our walk with the Spirit so that, so that our life is bearing the fruit of the Spirit. God has given us one another as a family for this purpose. This is how we are meant to live, to live our life together. See, when we believe the good news of the gospel in, in, our, in our over churched in some sense or under gospeled in, in, in probably a better sense um, world, we believe that the gospel is just about our individual salvation, that we are, we are saved and we can live our life and one day we'll go to heaven. But the, the truth of the gospel is that, yes, we are saved, we are redeemed, we will go to heaven one day. But right now, God has given us a family. God has given us brothers and sisters. He is our father, and, and, and other believers share that father, and we have brothers and sisters. And God has placed us in a body, in a body for our own good and for the good of, of the body itself, brothers and sisters to help one another in, in this walk. Brothers and sisters to help one another walk with the Spirit. Sometimes, especially when we, when we refuse to listen to the Spirit, when, when, we, when we have covered our ears and said no to the Spirit, oftentimes God sends our brothers and, and sisters to speak on behalf of the Spirit. That's what our brothers and sisters are doing when they're calling us to walk with Him. So what would it look like for us to be a church walking by the Spirit? I, I, think, I, I, I think one thing that's amazing here when we talk about um, a Spirit-filled church, oftentimes maybe, maybe our mind goes to signs and wonders. And I am not against signs and wonders, I promise you that. But that's not at all what Paul talks about here. When he talks about walking by the Spirit, one of the things that he talks about and, and one of the things that would be a mark of us if we were a church walking by the Spirit, we are, we are doing in this life together we are walking together in the spirit and we are helping one another to walk with the spirit and when we do that then 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 we are helping one another in in not just this journey but we together begin to bear the fruit of the spirit this is hard i know but it is the call of god there is um, another thing that I think Paul uh, said we will see in a church walking with the Spirit. We talked about the fruit of the Spirit last week, and again, it's easy to make each of those um, virtues just about us individually, like it makes us good and virtuous people. Um, people who are, for example, loving. And this is where I want to sit for a minute. You're going to have to think with me and sort of work through this together. Um, but, but loving people, right? The, the first fruit mentioned um, in the fruit of the Spirit is love. Paul connects love with something more than just being nice people that other people like. We think of loving people. They are, oh, they're nice people. They always have kind things to say. They're loving people. But Paul connects um, the kind of love that, that he's talking about here with something else. He connects it with serving. If we are a church walking in the Spirit together, we are serving one another through love. 
serving one another through love. So again, um, this is a great thing to me. Like it, it, we, we, we look for the miraculous too often and we miss the Spirit already at work. If we are a church walking with the Spirit, then we're going to be a church serving one another through love. Look at verse 13, chapter 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love do what? Serve one another. Serve one another. And then if you move down to chapter 6 and look at verse 9, verses 9 and 10, he says, let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So stick with me here. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And when we love people like, like, like Paul is talking about here, he used the word agape love. That, that, is a, that is a self-sacrificing love, an unmerited love. That's, that's the fruit of the Spirit. It bears that sacrificing love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And when we love people like that, we are moved to act for their good. So our love is not just a happy, feel-good uh, hug and a pat on the back. Our, our love doesn't just make us nice and likable people. It moves us to be the kind of people who, even at sacrifice, serve one another. And we talk a lot about serving at New City. If you're, if you're new, you'll hear a lot about it. Um, but, but, but serving isn't just something that we add to a list of things to do. It's not just a religious thing that we add to our list of things that we ought to do. We ought to serve. Um, servant is actually one of our identities in Christ. When we are made new creations and we become new people, this is what we become. Servants. Servants. In Romans 8, Paul makes it clear that we are being shaped into the image of Jesus. Our sanctification means that we are being moved more and more to look like Jesus. Now, this is the people that we were created to be, right? So, so we, are, we are being remade and shaped into the people that we were meant to be before sin entered into the world. And the one person who did everything right was who? Jesus, right? And so this is how that connects with Romans 8. If we had lived a perfect life and had no sin in our life, then our life would look like the life of Jesus. So our sanctification is the process of more and more looking like Jesus, being shaped into the image of Jesus. So as we mature in our faith, that doesn't mean that we just have more years under our belt as a, as a Christian. If we are maturing in our faith, we are looking more and more like Jesus, and that means we are serving like him. When Jesus with, was with his disciples... His disciples, like us sometimes, we tend to fight over all the wrong things. And his disciples would often fight over who was going to be the highest authority among the disciples. right? And they were jockeying with Jesus for position. And one day Jesus addressed them. And he said this in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 25. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Now remember, this is Jesus, the image that we are being shaped into. He says, but whoever would be great among you must be your what? Servant. And whoever would be first, whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Son of Man came... Not to be served, but to serve. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul talks about this, and he calls the Philippian church to have the same mind or attitude about themselves that Jesus had about himself, who, who did not count his equality with God as something to, held, to be held on to, but, but gladly left that behind, and he humbled himself, taking on the flesh of humanity. That is a humbling thing compared to the glory that he left behind. Jesus took on the flesh of humanity. Even more humbling than that, when Paul describes what that was, it says that he became like a slave. 
The word that Paul uses there is the word that is used generally for slave and not just for servant, right? And so what Paul is saying is that Jesus came, he, 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 he humbly set aside all of his glory, and with joy he came and took on the flesh of humanity, even the flesh of humanity as a slave a slave, so that he could serve humanity and serve us. Here's my point. When we walk by the Spirit, we bear the fruit of the Spirit, and that means more and more we look like Jesus. And the love that the Spirit manifests in and through us is the same love that we see in Jesus, and that love serves, even at great cost. So let me, let me press that further, right? We should be serving. We should serve. Uh, when, when, when we walk with the Spirit, bearing the image of Jesus, serving isn't something that we do for an hour and a half, one Sunday a month to fill a slot at church. Now, that is a good thing. I'm not saying resign. <laughs> Keep serving. I'm saying that's not everything. It, it, it is being a servant is, is, is who we are in every area of our life every day. When, when Jesus uses the word slave and when Paul uses the word slave, even, even as a bond servant, it wasn't a nine to five job. It's what you were 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There was never a time in your life when you stopped being that. And so as we are being shaped into servants like Jesus is a servant, then that means we serve here on Sunday mornings. And man, some of y'all do such an incredible job with that. You amaze me. Always jumping in to fill a slot, um, always helping out, right? You should be encouraged today. These words are not meant to say you're not doing enough today. I want you to hear me on that loud and clear. I, I, I am just telling you what a servant is. So, so, so you should serve here, this church body, right? The, the, the people who are here, the visitors who are here, we should do that. But we should also serve when we leave here in our MCs, our, our missional communities, the groups that meet in homes. You should serve there as well. You should be willing and joyfully saying, what do you need? What role can I fill in our missional community? In this small family, what can I do to help out? It's not for you to just come and sit. You are a servant and a part of this family, so serve. Again, some of y'all are doing an incredible job there. I don't want you to hear this is coming to you. I, I am rejoicing with you and I am thankful for you. So we serve here, we serve in our MC, but, but, but not only there, we serve at work. No matter what our role is, no matter what our title is, no matter what our level of authority is, even if we're the owner of the company, Jesus has made us a servant. And so we serve the people who work under us and we serve the people who work for us. That's what servants do. We serve our, our kids, even at home. We serve there. We serve at our kids' school. Our kids play, play sports. We serve wherever they're playing sports. We serve their team. We serve their parents. We serve the coaches. We serve the park that they play at. Why do we do all that? Because we're servants. That's what servants do. And, and we do that because the fruit of the Spirit is agape love. It's the love that Jesus had. And, and, and it's the love that Jesus had that moved him to serve others. We, we serve because we walk by the Spirit, and that's the, the fruit that walking with the, the Spirit bears. So if a church is walking by the Spirit, right? If a church, all of us, if New City Church is a church that is known to be walking by the Spirit, then the people of that church are not strangers to serving because they are servants. Now, going back to chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, he says, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith, especially to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Here is what I want you to notice. The call to serve is a call to serve everyone, everyone, not just your church family. 
right? So I'm going to repeat myself here. I said it a moment ago. We serve here at church as we're gathered. We serve in love for one another. We serve during the week at our MC meeting and helping wherever there are needs. We serve at work no matter what our title or position or level of authority. We serve our kids. We serve their school. We serve the park. Wherever we go, we serve. Now let me put this with backing up to chapter 5 verses 13 and 14 which we've read for you were called to freedom brothers only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another right serve one another for the whole law is fulfilled in one word you shall love who your neighbor you shall love your neighbor as yourself love The fruit of the Spirit shows itself most certainly in our service here to to one another, right? To the people who, who are here, this sweet family that is New City Church. But it is also supposed to show itself as we serve our neighbor. Our neighbor who is different than us, our neighbor that, 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 that is not always not nice to us, uh, the, the, the neighbor who is not a part of this sweet family that is ours. Now, I'm, I'm going to take this probably a step further than Paul intended to the Galatians, but I feel very confident that he would be okay with what I'm about to say. When we serve our neighbor in the kind of love that we are talking about here as the overflow of the Spirit's work in us, we have an opportunity to engage in mission. Do you hear me? So, so what it looks like for us as a church, if, if we are walking in the Spirit, then it means we are a people on God's mission. We are a people on God's mission. We are engaged and engaging in God's mission together. If we are a church that is walking with the Spirit, then we are engaging together in God's mission. Now, I want you to hear me. Everybody listening? Serving is not the mission. Repeat that after me. Serving is not the mission. Serving is not the mission. That is not the mission of God. I, I am saying that, that, that Paul saw that through our service, through our love for our brothers and sisters, those outside of the body, when we love our neighbor as ourselves and serve our neighbor like Jesus served us, when we help them, then what we are doing is creating an opportunity for mission. We are, we are earning an ear for them to hear the gospel from us. The mission of God is seeing his people redeemed from sin, reconciled to him, and one day restored to be everything they were meant to be. That's the mission of God. God is redeeming, reconciling, and restoring. And and the way that people enter into this redemption and this reconciliation, and ultimately the way that they are restored, is through faith in the work of Jesus. It is through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the good news of the gospel. That is how we are redeemed from sin. That is how we are reconciled to the Father. That is how we are one day restored to be the people that we are meant to be. Jesus came to do what we cannot do ourselves. This is the good news of the gospel. You got to hear it, right? You got to hear it this morning. This is the good news of the gospel. Jesus came to do what you and I cannot do. The perfect life that we were meant to live, the perfect life that has to be lived in order to stand forevermore with our righteous and holy God and enjoy him forever. That, that life we failed to live and we will fail to live and every other human will except for one and that's Jesus. Jesus lived the perfect human life that we were intended to live. He perfectly loved God. He perfectly loved the people around him. He did that on our behalf. Jesus died the death that we deserve. The Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. And what that means is the penalty for sin. When we commit sin, the penalty from our holy, righteous, and just God, the penalty is eternal separation and condemnation from him. 
Jesus died the death that we deserved. When he died on the cross, he died in our place, the death that we deserve, suffering the very wrath of God that should be ours. On the third day, the beautiful news is that he rose. Jesus rose, defeating death and sin and Satan, and he did that on our behalf as well, so that when we, when we believe in this good news, that, that God has provided what we could not do our, on our own, when we trust in what he has done, rather than in our own self-righteousness and what we, what we can do to make ourselves holy, when we trust in him rather than in ourselves, then the righteousness of Jesus is given to us. The victory that he won over death and sin and Satan becomes ours. We are redeemed from our sin. We are reconciled in our relationship with our Father. And one day we will be fully restored just as we were meant to be. We will be the people that we are meant to be. And we will live with people like that. Our family. And we will be with him forever. And all of that is our gift simply through faith and his work. And one day Jesus is going to return just as he promised. This is, this is part of the good news, right? One day Jesus is going to return, and when he does, he will judge his enemies, those who do not love and follow him. He will judge them, and he will fully and fi finally establish his kingdom. And in that kingdom, he will establish justice and peace. Justice, it's the justice and peace that we long for. The justice and peace that we long for deep in our heart, deep in our soul, he will establish it in his kingdom kingdom. He will right every wrong that ever has been. He will fix every broken thing that is broken. Tears and mourning will be turned to joy and laughter, and we will be with him forevermore. Isn't that beautiful? A beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing has been done for us in Jesus, a thing that we could never accomplish on our own. And God is at work. Y'all, listen, this is, this is what's so incredible about it. God is at work this very minute through this good news, through this work of Jesus. God is at work right now redeeming and reconciling broken humanity to himself. And he calls every one of us to be a part of that. That great commission that he gave to the disciples wasn't just for the, the, the first generation of disciples. That commission is our commission. God is commissioning us as we go to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that he commanded. Their commission is our commission to God's great mission. Loving and serving our neighbor gives us the opportunity to proclaim that good news. Loving our neighbor, serving our neighbor is not the mission. It simply opens the door for us to talk about our glorious Savior, Jesus. To, to share with them the good news that I was once lost and now I'm found. To, to share with them that I was once blind and now I see. That, that I was a beggar and now I am filled. That I was a fatherless orphan and now I no, not only have a father, but, but I have this household of brothers and sisters. That I was once and still sometimes am a self-centered, self-loving person seeking only my good. But now, now I love my neighbor as well. And all of this is because of Jesus. Because of Jesus. This is the mission of Acts 1-8. Remember when we talked about Acts 1-8? We, 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 we talked about Jesus talking to the disciples just before he ascended to heaven. And he said, listen, the Holy Spirit is coming, right? Like, this is great news. The Holy Spirit is coming. And he's coming with power. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll know. And when the Holy Spirit comes with this power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You'll tell the world who I am and you'll tell them what I've done. It, 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 to the uttermost parts of the earth. This is your mission. And you have the same Holy Spirit that came to them with power. This is the mission uh, that, that, that you are empowered to carry out. It, it's the Spirit in you and through you that will convict the world of, of sin and righteousness and judgment. As you serve your neighbor and share with them the good news of the gospel. 
It's the Holy Spirit who will, who will bear witness of who Jesus is and what he has done. So what does it, what does it look like? Again, what does it look like when a, when a church is walking by the Spirit? It looks like a people who are so filled with love for their neighbor that by the power of the Spirit, they can't not talk about Jesus. I'm sure some of you, if you've been around long enough, may have caught on by now in answering this question of what does a church look like when it is walking by the Spirit? It looks like a family of missionary servants. Disciples making disciples. It looks like a people helping others live in light of the gospel. If you don't know, that's our mission and vision at New City Church. A church who walks together with the Spirit. Certainly it's a church of people growing individually into the image of Jesus as, as, as they yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit, to His conviction of sin and righteousness. It's a people learning and growing as the Holy Spirit teaches us, teaches us the Word of God and, and reminds us of the words of Jesus. It is a family, a family. People who recognize that God has placed them in this particular body uh, of believers as, as He has desired. And He has done so and, and gifted them for the good of the body and for their own good as well. It is a family helping one another to walk with Jesus. Walk by the Spirit. A family who, who, who warns one another when, when we begin to stray away, when the fruit in our life is no longer the fruit of the Spirit but becomes the fruit of the flesh. It is a brother and sister, that kind of family, who says, man, where are you going? I don't think this is right. It's a family who is on mission together, missional communities reaching their, their neighborhood and, and the community around them together. It, it, it's missional communities planting new missional communities to make room for more people to be a part of that family and to enjoy this walk with the Spirit. It's, it's us, New City Church, being known as a place and a people of love. Not a, not a people always fighting against something. Not a people who vote Republican or Democrat. A people of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those, those people as we walk together with the Spirit. New City Church, if we, were, if we were a church together walking with the Spirit, we would, we would be a church of great faith. We would be a church of great faith, attempting great things that only our amazing God could do because we believe, because we believe the Spirit goes before us. We believe the Spirit guards behind us. We believe the Spirit is with us always. New City Church. Let us walk by the Spirit together. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your Spirit. Thank you for your, your grace toward us. The grace that you have already shown in forgiving us for ignoring the Holy Spirit, for not trusting, for not believing the promises of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are with us even in that. Patiently with us, being our helper even when we don't see it. Help us, Holy Spirit, in the days to come to remember these words, to remember the words that, 
the Father has given us his word. Remind us again and again of the words of Jesus and the promises of Jesus. Help us, our helper. In Jesus' name, amen. We close out this morning as we do every week at New City. We, we have communion together, celebrating the goodness of God to us through Jesus. We practice open communion here. That means you don't have to be a member of New City Church to enjoy communion uh, with us this morning. You are invited. If you are a follower of Christ, a believer, you are invited to, uh, to join us at the table Um, We have communion set up behind me in the back of the sanctuary downstairs and upstairs in the balcony as well. We have individual communion cups and you can take those. We have bread and juice as well. The bread represents the body of Jesus given for us. The blood, that's the juice um, shed for us. By his blood we are redeemed. By his blood we are made children of God forever. Take a moment as we sing the first song this morning and um, if there's anything the Holy Spirit has convicted you of that you need to repent of, that means turn from and turn to Him. If there's anything that you need to seek forgiveness for, for ignoring Him, for not loving Him, I don't know, whatever it is the Spirit has convicted you of this morning, repent of that, turn from that and turn to Him and receive the grace that's yours in Jesus. Come to the table then and celebrate Him. Take the bread. Dip it in the juice and celebrate Jesus with us this morning. We'll have members of our prayer team who will come forward. They're going to be wearing a green lanyard. If you would like prayer this morning, they would love to pray with you or for you. If you would like to know more about um, what it means to love and follow Jesus, they'd love to talk with you about that as well. Would you stand?
drawing and the calling of the Holy Spirit, we have been brought into the kingdom. And it's by the power of the Holy Spirit that we continue to be shaped to be more and more like Jesus, who is our shepherd and our provider. So let's go this morning celebrating together. I'm gonna live again I'm 
gonna trade this cross for a crown no this is not the end and when you call my name I will take my rest there's a mansion in glory and you're gonna meet me there I shall not want I shall not Every tear from my eyes, and I shall not walk. I shall not walk. I shall not walk. I'll be home in his presence forever, and I shall not walk. For the Lord is my shepherd. For the Lord. For the Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. Now receive this blessing. May the helper whom the Father sent in Jesus' name teach you all things. May he bring the truths of the gospel to your mind when you need them the most. And may the Holy Spirit give you strength to bring this good news to others that they may be forgiven in Jesus. Share this good news with others. New City Church, you are sent.